Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to DNews Plus today. I am Trace. This is episode two of three in our series on pain. It's gonna be good though, don't worry. I know it's kind of a sad thing, I guess, or a painful topic, but it's really cool. See, pain is basically a warning call to your brain. Now, if you don't know how that works, make sure you check out yesterday's episode. But today, we're gonna talk about the physical process, like what actually happens when you're experiencing pain. So essentially, the point of pain is to tell your brain, hey, something's wrong. You should maybe look at your hand, it's on a stove right now. It's basically like the brain getting a message from your hand that says, ah, right? That's what it feels like and that's what you do. It tells your brain, this isn't right and you should do something about it and pay attention. So let's break this down. There are four different stages. One, contact with the stimulus. This could be a chemical, it could be a burn, it could be a, a cut, it could be pressure, it could be punctures. Those are mechanical more than chemical. It could also be something that causes tissue damage, which are then registered by your nociceptors. Those are, by the way, microscopic pain receptors in your skin. And remember that, because we're gonna bring it up later. And then each of those receptors is at the end of a nerve cell. Those nerve cells are connected eventually all the way back up to your brain, but we'll get there. So on the end of a long nerve fiber or an axon, there's a receptor. That receptor is activated. An electrical signal is sent up that nerve. And then you get to two, reception. That single nerve fiber is bundled with others and they form some kind of peripheral nerve. So say you cut your thumb, like I mentioned at the end of my last episode, you would have the nerve at the end of your thumb registering the pain, passing it up to your arm, and then that would slowly go to the spinal cord. At the spinal cord, you get to the three section, that's transmission, and within the spinal cord, the signal meets the dorsal horn, which is a receptor for several different types of sensory information from the body. Electrical signals there are transmitted across synapses via neurotransmitters, a lot of big words, but it's really awesome, and it gets all the way up into the brain. Once it's in the brain, that's number four, by the way, pain is processed. The signal goes to the thalamus, the sorting station that sends signals to different parts of the brain, depending on what they are. The somatosensory cortex is responsible for physical sensations. The frontal cortex is in charge of thinking. The limbic system is linked to emotions. When pain gets there, it has to be processed. But does emotional pain get processed too? So let's, let's sidebar on that for a second. So we've primarily been discussing physical pain, you know, cutting and poking and punching and stuff. But what about emotional pain? You know, like getting kicked in the heart. That sucks. When you get dumped, sometimes it does hurt physically. And this manifests because of an actual thing called broken heart syndrome. You can get chest pain, you can get headaches, and it's also known as Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. It's because though it's cheesy, like my girl Kesha said, your love is my drug. It literally is. In your brain, when you're in love, there are chemicals being squirted all over the place. Your brain's ventral tegmental area, or VTA, exports dopamine, the same hormone that triggers addicts to crave cocaine. It's a big reward chemical in your brain, and being in love is a reward for your body. We're encouraged by our own body chemistry to do this. When love is gone, so is that dopamine. And that lack of feel-good hormones is very similar to coming down off of an addiction. Your brain has to pump out other things to take its place, so it pumps out stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, and that overwhelms your heart. And the left ventricle can get hurt, essentially. It pumps blood to the rest of your body, and it bulges, and it can't pump properly. So, kind of bringing it back, whether it's a paper cut or the love of your life suddenly ghosting you, you can just sit there and wait it out and your body will heal itself or you can take some Tylenol. Yes, it also works for emotional pain. A study done uh, by the University of Kentucky used Tylenol to see if it had effects on people who felt rejection. They split up their volunteers into two different groups and some took a placebo and some took Tylenol. And the people who took Tylenol experienced fewer feelings of rejection, which is pretty amazing. Anyway, emotional pain, also can be considered physical pain and sidebar. So we just talked about processing. We're already up into the brain. Your brain knows there's pain. It's processing it as such. And in case you need a refresher, it's something like, ah, like that, right? Got it. So one way to get rid of that is with painkillers. Remember when we were talking about nociceptors earlier and I told you to put a pin in it, not literally again, cause pain, but they're activated when your body has crossed the threshold for pain. So certain chemicals can alter that threshold. 
Some will make you sensitive to pain. Damaged cells produce one of these chemicals that make you more sensitive to pain. It's called arachidonic acid. There are also two enzymes at play here called COX-1 and COX-2, C-O-X, all caps. It converts the acid into something called prostaglandin H2. That converts to even more chemicals, which we could continue to list because that's how the body works. At those chemicals increase body temperature and inflammation, they increase pain sensitivity, and the painkillers, what they do is they step into the middle of that and they split those up. They stop or stall, depending on whether it's aspirin or ibuprofen, aspirin stops it, ibuprofen stalls it, the conversion of COX-1 and COX-2 into that prostaglandin. So, aspirin and ibuprofen find the pain and they make it go away, but not literally. It's kind of a napalm effect. They don't know where the pain is. You know, ibuprofen and aspirin are just spread throughout your body, through your bloodstream. And then if they get to somewhere where there's a bunch of COX-1 and 2 converting into prostaglandin, they stop it. It's like, you know, the cops on a beat. That's all it's trying to do. It doesn't target your pain, even though the commercials may say that's what it's doing. Educator George Zayden explains this really, really well in a TED-Ed original. You can check it out. It's animated. It's really fun. But we can also talk about other medications and how they work on your body. You know, instead of just listing a bunch of pills, though, let's just talk about the crazy out there treatments. Yes, almost all painkillers essentially work the same. They stop you from experiencing the pain. That doesn't mean that the signals aren't still being sent to your brain. That doesn't mean that you're not still experiencing something bad. Painkillers just stop you noticing that. They don't stop the actual problem. There are things that can do that, but uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of the out there treatments for that pain. Things to make you kind of forget that you have pain, hopefully. One of those, and a really popular one, is exercise. I know that's kind of crazy, but it's actually not. Exercise can help relieve some pain as long as it's not, you know, painful to exercise, uh, and it can improve blood and oxygen flow to muscles, and it can make your body stronger, which sometimes that pain can go away then. Uh, it also can improve immune function and do a bunch of other things. Exercises in general, awesome. The crazy ones are more like electrical stimulation, which most people associate with pain. Being shocked is something that you would not necessarily associate with getting rid of pain. However, electrodes can be surgically implanted on a peripheral nerve so that the electrical current is delivered to that nerve via a controlled electrical generator that can either mask or block out pain signals. There's also hypnosis, which was approved by the American Medical Association, by the way, in 1958, and it's used to control the amount of pain that you can withstand. People don't really get how this works, but if you remember from earlier, the final step of all of this pain reception comes from how your brain interprets those signals from your nerves, and it's thought that hypnosis modulates the way your brain does that. It modulates activity in the anterior cingulate cortex, which links the limbic system, or your emotional sections, to sensory cortical areas, and it dissociates negative emotions and suffering, things that we commonly associate with pain. Because feelings can, as we mentioned in that pretty big sidebar earlier, associate you with pain or cause pain. Also, because we live in the future, you can use lasers to fight pain. Uh, now, this doesn't go without controversy, I want to lead in with, but it's thought that infrared laser beams, depending on the wavelength, can hit cells in such a way that they increase local blood flow and desensitize those local nociceptors. But you can't just, like, go to the store and buy a laser beam and start, you know, flashing it at yourself. No point it in your eye, ever. But uh, your best bet is actually to go to your doctor and figure out the best way to treat your pain. Be honest about your pain assessment scale that we talked about earlier because we're all different. We all feel pain differently, but being honest will help you get the correct care. The thing is, we're all different and we all feel pain differently. So what I feel as a six, you might feel as a two, just because I'm a little, a little weakling when it comes to pain. I wanna get hurt. But it doesn't make a lot of sense because you would think that if this is about telling your brain, hey, something's going on and I'm damaged, you would want them to be the same, right? Because my skin isn't less or more damageable than your skin. However, that's not how it works. If you want to know how it works, you'll have to tune in tomorrow. So make sure you subscribe so you get all the episodes of DNews Plus. And you can also come find the show on Twitter. We are at DNews. You can tweet us with the hashtag DNews Plus if you have questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes. You can also come find me on Twitter. I'm at Trace Dominguez. I get your tweets. 
don't worry, we're working on beefing back up some of these series to get five episodes and get all sorts of other cool stuff going on. So make sure you keep tweeting at me about it. And thanks so much for tuning in today. We'll see you tomorrow on D News Plus.